to my third point, rapid global mobility. It is both an enabler and a strategic capability unto itself, underpinning vital functions such as crisis and natural disaster response, joint combat support, global logistics, and rapid global mobility force provides our nation with the in-flight refueling capability of the KC-10, the KC-135, and in the future KC-46 tankers, as well as the ability to haul massive amounts of cargo with unparalleled speed to distant destinations from wartime materiel to humanitarian relief supplies. This is another manifestation of the inherent flexibility of air power with capabilities and assets, C-17, C-130s, and others that are distinctly and inherently Air Force in character. Employed to airdrop equipment to U.S. and coalition forces, they they affect ongoing activities in wide-ranging battle spaces. Just as easily, they can simultaneously deliver life-saving medical and disaster relief supplies, as in our most recent example to our friends in Japan, achieving strategic level objectives and bolstering international ties through genuine American expression of compassion, of generosity, and of goodwill. This capability must be retained at a scale that's commensurate with the overall size of the U.S. Armed Forces and consistent with operational plans. The Mobility Requirement Study has traditionally served as a baseline, and it must be updated as we go forward with efforts to modernize and recapitalize our mobility forces accordingly. Finally, and to my fourth point, globally scaled intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. America is afforded with this capability an unparalleled decision-making advantage. We will continue to provide safe and reliable mix of Earth's orbiting and air-breathing assets, each affording unrivaled data collection capability particularly in the area of remotely piloted aircraft and sensors. The U.S. military and our Air Force have made tremendous progress with operating concepts and infrastructure that underwrite our global ISR capability and training and equipping of our personnel who do this important work. Air Force capability to process and exploit this raw data toward dissemination of timely and usable intelligence will continue to be in high demand for national level decision making and for joint operational planning and execution in theaters of operation. While the size and shape of our ISR capabilities must be constantly evaluated and rationalized in relation to national and combatant commander requirements, we remain committed to continuing the institutionalization of ISR and, expert, and its expertise in our Air Force. And most assuredly, we will not return to pre-9-11 force levels. Again, underpinning and embedded in each of these unique contributions is an additional distinctive and enduring core function, the remarkable ability to command and control air, space, and cyber operations. This unmatched high volume C2 capability spans all level of operations, in peace and in war, and enables responsive tasking and execution of geographically and operationally diverse missions. These are capabilities that we deem clearly essential for our nation's strategic interests, for its economic prosperity, and for military readiness to respond, such as this past year, when we were fully engaged in Japan, delivering life-saving and life-sustaining supplies and support, and then responded, ladies and gentlemen, halfway around the world, all the way on the opposite end of the operational spectrum to help enforce the 
UN Security Council resolution in its mandate in Libya. By the end of March and the beginning of April, U.S. airmen were single-handedly and concurrently responsible for evacuating 7,500 American citizens from hazardous zones and delivering 60 percent, close to 5 million pounds of U.S. relief supplies to Japan, while in Libya, contributing more than 65 percent of all coalition sorties, including 99 percent of operational airlifts, 79 percent of in-flight refueling, 50 percent of airborne reconnaissance, 40 percent of strike missions. One, ladies and gentlemen, would be hard-pressed to find a more impressive, more compelling inst instance of strategic flexibility and versatility in all its dimensions, all at the same time. So we may have to carefully consider reduced capacities in some areas while maintaining and perhaps increasing investment in others such as the four that I just discussed. We must carefully consider and calibrate our acceptance of risk manifested in a force that's smaller in size and scale. Most assuredly, we will still be an extremely capable and effective force. But the simple matter, one of physics, is that we will be able to be in fewer places and achieve fewer effects in rapid succession to which we all have become accustomed. We can mitigate some risks through enhancing collaboration with our joint teammates, and we are, such as with air-sea battle and our long-range strike initiative. We can also continue bolstering our partnerships with global air forces like the Canadians that share our common interests in interoperable platforms and systems. Through co cooperation and collaboration with partner forces, both joint and coalition, we can mutually expand broad spectrum capabilities and utilize the additive effects of our pooled capacity to continue providing appropriately scaled air power for the nation. But in any scenario, structuring our force must be done according to our strategy and our priorities. If we seek to avoid a hollow force, we cannot merely execute across the board cuts. As Secretary Panetta has warned, these sorts of ill-conceived reductions in defense spending will inflict real damage to the well-being of our airmen and their families and ultimately undermine our ability to protect the nation. Instead, we have committed to a priority of readiness, and we will hold the line against longer-term erosion in combat power availability and preparedness. One of the most favored measures of character, whether of individuals or of institutions, is how one rises to meet the most daunting, most intractable challenges that we face. Pundits and commentators intone the age of uncertainty, leaving us, as one has put it, grasping for some type of certainty in everything from threat to resources, to pronouncements effectively, their pronouncements effectively mark the time for us to decide whether to curse our luck or to celebrate our opportunities. But toward the long-awaited, budding springtime of increased confidence, we can all embrace if we so choose, a positively a focused attitude. We can staunchly believe, ladies and gentlemen, staunchly believe in the enormity of what we can and will accomplish together. And we can maintain faith and strengthen by optimism, shared purpose and common cause. So for me, I recall 
events like pinning three silver stars and five bronze stars for valor at a single ceremony at McCord, like B-1s departing in the middle of a snowstorm, below minimum, certainly combat rules, to fly 20-some hours, hours to Libya and help enforce the UN Security Council mandate. And events like all hands, airmen and their families, contributing to a massive joint and combined humanitarian relief effort in Japan after multiple concurrent disasters there. And like the combination, ladies and gentlemen, of a decade of effort, our nation's triumph in eliminating the perpetrator of the 9-11 attacks, knowing that airmen were an invaluable part of that national effort. 